Resident Evil came out 24 years ago on the PlayStation 1. I can't believe it was that long ago, but it's true. It's easy to live in your bubble and think everyone knows what Resident Evil is, but there's plenty of people who haven't played the original games, and plenty more in the new generation that haven't even seen them. They've probably seen the RE2 remake and maybe RE7, so let's take a look at the old classic. And when I say the old classic, I'm not talking about the original Resident Evil, I'm talking about Resident Evil, the 2002 remake for the GameCube. It faithfully recreates the atmosphere and gameplay of the original while refining its mechanics and fleshing out its story. It updates every Every single angle of the original with a new drawing for use in the pre-rendered backgrounds. A few areas are redesigned and added to, and it's always an improvement. It is objectively superior in every way, except maybe for some preferences for some of the original soundtrack. Its atmosphere is unmatched by any other installment, and it looks so good. I've shown it to people who didn't even realize the backgrounds were paintings. Among series purists and old school fans, it's pretty popular opinion that the Resident Evil remake for GameCube is the definitive Resident Evil experience. Maybe Resident Evil 2 is the most famous of the originals, and maybe Part 3 has a more passionate fan base to which I belong but the original slash remake is the real deal. It is by no means a perfect game. Any game designed in the early years of 3D graphics is gonna have issues, especially in the control department. Resident Evil doesn't have to be perfect though, because what it does well, it does so well that its flaws don't really matter. RE2 and definitely RE3 went pretty far into the bigger is better mentality, something I appreciate in a sequel sometimes. As much as I love those games, they lean heavier on action and larger than life moments. The original by comparison is a much more restrained experience. It's quiet and subtle, lonely even. It's exactly how a game should be that takes place in a mansion out in the forest. You're not in the big city, you're not in a populated village or African town, it's just a big house. The slow, quiet atmosphere is what makes its moments of horror effective. You're never numb to it because the game isn't throwing things at you all the time. Just look at the contrast between the opening areas of Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 2, both titles on the PlayStation 1. RE2 throws you into the action immediately, burning cars, seven or eight zombies on the street, trapped, dramatic music, once you make it to the gun store, zombies burst through the window and eat this guy alive. Then you get his shotgun and start blasting. RE1 starts in the main hall of the mansion, transitioning to an eerie dining room with just a ticking clock. A conversation over a bloodstain leads you to discovering a single zombie devouring someone. That shows you all you need to know about the different tones these games have. RE1 feels like a classic horror movie with a little action schlock thrown in for fun, while RE2 feels like a big budget Hollywood zombie action movie. Both are great, but there's something about the magic of that first game. I'm not here to talk about how this game was created, the history of the series, examination of the characters and plot. There are other channels better suited to that kind of thing. I won't show the entire game and its story. This isn't a deep analysis of the game either. On this channel, I like to present the player experience, what it's like to play the game and be in this place. If you play this game, you want to pick the first difficulty setting because that's normal. There is no hard setting on your first go. Just normal, easy, and dumbass easy. If you're playing this on PC, you can set up a program called Door Skip that skips the old loading animations between rooms, and I'll have a link to that in the video notes below. Depending on if you choose to play as Jill or Chris, the game's starting cast is different, and so are the narrative directions. Jill is the standout character of this series. Not only is she more interesting, but the game plays better as her on your first time because while she does take more damage than Chris, cause you know, men are more resistant to zombie bites, Jill has two more inventory slots than Chris, so the game is much more forgiving in terms of item management. Jill also gets an early shotgun, and she gets the grenade launcher. Come on, Jill can even play the piano while no culture Chris has to get Rebecca to do it for him. On top of all that, only Jill interacts with Barry, and for as cute as Rebecca is, Resident Evil just isn't right without Barry Burton and his big gun. After reports of murders in the Arclay Mountains of Raccoon City, the Special Task and Rescue Service sends in a team to investigate the area. That squad disappears, and a second squad comes in to look for them and finds the wreckage of their helicopter. Why are they going in the middle of the night? Who knows? They get ambushed by angry dogs, and a few team members make it to a nearby mansion. When your captain, Wesker, sends you and Barry to check out a gunshot from the west side of the house, you're first given control of your character. And I want to talk about how good this first room is. In the early 3D era, there was a style of controlling your character called tank controls. Tank controls functioned by making the up button always direct your character forward. 
So you aren't supposed to press the direction that you want the character to go, you steer them by putting yourself in their position. Even though Jill is facing me, if I press up, she walks in my direction. If I turn her to her left with the left button, up now directs her this way. It's weird at first. This is a control scheme that has been abandoned in the generations that followed. And I'm not here to say that tank controls are great, but I am going to tell you about what is great about them. And that's the ability to implement a cinematic camera style. When we play games now with our fully 3D worlds and total camera control, games don't feel like cinematic experiences as we play them. Because when you watch films, usually, the camera isn't flying around like that. Sure, there's handheld and dolly shots and computer generated scenes, but when we look at something like a small scope horror movie, scenes are usually constructed of a series of well placed camera shots. Things are meticulously placed in the frame to evoke a feeling from the audience. There's an art to cinematography, and Resident Evil's still camera using 3D characters against 2D pre-rendered backgrounds gives the game a movie-like feel that in my opinion hasn't been captured again to this day. When moving Jill forward, the camera is static until she crosses a certain point, and then the camera cuts to another angle, just like it would in a movie. It's jarring at first, but it really does feel like you're controlling a character in a movie. This leads to suspenseful moments where you're walking down a hallway and you're scared to go forward because you can't see what's waiting for you once the camera angle changes. Even though Jill is looking forward, we can't always see what's in front of her. Some players may just find this straight up frustrating. I never did, because it feels like a horror movie to me. It feels like a scene where you're focused on a scared character, but the camera isn't focused on what they're looking at, it's focused on them. And though the character can see what's in front of them, the audience can't. It's a good way to build tension and set up a scare. This east wing staircase area is the perfect example. Open this door and the camera focuses tight on Jill. Take a few steps forward and the camera shifts to an angle that leads to an open area with a staircase, and you can hear zombies breathing and shuffling around. You can partially see a zombie beyond the corner. A few steps more and you get a downward angle that reveals a zombie with his back turned to you. If you just run into this room haphazardly, you could get bitten. You want to proceed carefully in Resident Evil, and the static camera angles reinforce that. And because the static angles are so important to the feel of the game, the tank controls become necessary. A lot of the game's tension comes from the feeling of not knowing what's waiting for you around the corner. It's probably nothing, because zombies aren't in every room, but there could be one there, you just don't know. Since up always means forward, regardless of the angle, it means you can hold the up button to keep Jill walking forward while the camera changes to different perspectives. So I know tank controls aren't the smoothest control scheme ever made, but it really works for this game and its camera style. The first dining room is a great place to introduce the controls to the player, as they figure out how to steer the character forward and around this table as the camera jumps around, and the mood of this room is so good. Worried about this blood stain belonging to your partner Chris, you check out the next room, and you get another one of those tense camera moments. Your first instinct is to follow the camera direction showing the hallway, so you turn right and go that way, only to find locked doors. Returning to the original spot, you realize that you can walk down past the camera into a new angle, showing a dark room that conceals itself in the shadows and around the corner. You find a zombie kneeling over the corpse of someone from the first squad. And most players will try to fight the zombie because they don't know that you can just run back to Barry and he'll take care of it with his big gun. Right trigger aims, action button fires. You cannot move while shooting. They couldn't make that work with the tank controls and being able to aim up and down. It's stiff and a bit problematic, but it's how the game plays and it definitely adds some stress to the encounters. If you think about it, the ability to walk backwards while firing would completely break the game and trivialize the zombies. So the first zombie probably bites you once or twice. You realize it takes a lot to put him down, you stab him a couple times, he's finally dead and you don't have many bullets left. Get used to that. This is not a power fantasy. You're gonna die. You're gonna be low on healing items and ammo. If you try to kill everything, you're gonna end up in a bad spot. One of the greatest changes in the remake is the addition of defense items. It allows the game to be a bit more brutal with its enemy encounters, as you now have an automatic get the fuck off me tool. Soon after your encounter with the first zombie, you discover that Wesker has disappeared, and you go your own way to explore. 
There really is nothing else in video games like the Spencer Mansion from Resident Evil 1. This location has so much character, it's iconic and has never been topped. And part of the credit goes to the camera angles. It's not just the design of these rooms that stands out, it's the way they're framed. I could close my eyes right now and imagine every single room of this game, and I could draw the different angles they're shown from. Just look at this hallway, it's like you're directing the actor in a movie. And things like this just don't really happen outside of static angles and tank controls. Here in this hall, you can see a zombie's reflection in the mirror. You don't know exactly where he is beyond this corner, but you know he's there. It's so good. Exploring the mansion leads to the discovery of different keys, puzzle items, weapons, enemy types, and story notes. The notes are not excessive, found occasionally as you explore so they don't feel tedious to stop and look through. And the puzzle items are fun, if not a bit basic. I mean, they're not strawberry puzzles like in Alien Isolation where you just match the prompt. You do have to think about it. There may be a riddle that leads you to press buttons in a certain order, or else angry crows swoop down and attack you. There's a statue pushing puzzle that covers a gas vent that can kill you if you don't solve it correctly. Nothing amazing, but charming. Item-centric puzzles include things like replacing the gold shield with the bronze one so you can take the gold one with you, finding a chemical that you can put in the water pump to poison the killer plant that's blocking a key item, stuff like that. One of the most important parts of the game is managing all these items. With only 8 inventory slots, space is tight. You can't drop items and come back to them later. The game has a magic chest system where you put items you don't need into a chest found in a save room, and then those items can be accessed by any other chest in the game. Is it realistic? No. Is it acceptable for a video game? Yes. Not everything has to be realistic. If this were in a movie, it would be laughable. But in a video game, you gotta make concessions for the sake of gameplay. I mentioned save rooms. There are no checkpoints. Hard save only. Saving is done on typewriters, and only if you have ink ribbons. Ink ribbons are found around the game, and there's enough to save pretty consistently, probably a couple times per room. It's old school, it's not for babies. You need to be careful, as if you were really in a mansion with zombies. Dying takes you back to your last typewriter save, so you will lose progress. There's a real consequence to death in this game, and if you can't handle it, this game isn't for you. You'll come across some boss encounters, there's a giant snake that you fight before gaining access to the courtyard, and that's probably several hours into your exploration of the mansion. The first time you step out into the open air under the moonlight is truly a moment in the game. The courtyard leads you to the guardhouse, which is my favorite area. The guardhouse is all wooden hallways and small rooms for the now dead staff. The aesthetic change is really refreshing after all that time spent in the mansion, and the music in this place is so paranoid. I'll never forget the first time I walked into the recreation room and saw a giant spider right over me. What a great scare. The Resident Evil series is known more for its jump scares than its atmosphere of dread, but that's more the fault of the sequels. The original has famous jump scares for sure, but there are a lot of areas that make you scared to even walk forward. I could go on and on about this game, but I've pretty much covered what the experience is like. If I talked more, I would just be spoiling more areas and story points and enemy types. If you want to know more about the game, there are lots of great channels out there that have examined the game in more detail. I personally recommend The Sphere Hunter. I don't know anyone else who loves Resident Evil more than her, and I know she agrees that the GameCube remake will always be the true Resident Evil experience. Resident Evil is one of the greatest and most important games ever made. I hope this video gave you an appreciation of the game if you didn't have it before, and if you haven't played it in a long time, maybe it's time to jump back in. If you've never played it, I hope you check it out. You can get the Resident Evil HD Remaster on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. If you get it on PC, make sure you use a controller and not mouse and keyboard. And that's about it. Can you believe it? I made it through an entire video without mentioning Doom or God of War. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and I'll be back soon with a big video on God of War. See ya. Whoa, check out that new graphic. It was about time, right? Thank you to Crom Waits for designing this. I love it. Everyone check out his work on Twitter. He's a talented guy.